engage with, hopefully answer most of the questions that you have. We always promise we will not come knock on your door or bother you on the phone, but through the mail, we're gonna do our best to answer most of your questions. So thank you for doing that. We are honored to have you here today. Hey, it's fireworks season. I am so excited that starting today, you are able to purchase fireworks. All the proceeds go to help us send our high schoolers to camp. So today, come on by the fireworks booth. Uh, we're gonna be out there selling fireworks all day. If you just wanna donate to camp, you can come out there and drop that as well. I'd love to see you out there. Um, say hi to some of our students. Thank you so much in advance for all that you do for all of our students here at New Hope. Guys, I wish I could say I dressed up for you today, except for the fact you're here and I'm not. I am getting ready to get in the Colorado River and enjoy seven wonderful days through the Grand Canyon. But I am glad that in spite of my absence, you are present today. And there's a couple of things we want to let you know about. Uh, number one, we're going to be trying something new. What we would like for you to do is go to Facebook, like New Hope Community Church, and also read Pastor Mark's at least weekly blog that he's going to be posting. Uh, you might get some bonuses some week and get more than one, but minimally you will get one a week, and he's going to be talking about what life looks like from upper story perspectives. Daily living from an upper story perspective. I think he's already posted his first one, so head to Facebook, read it, let folks know you like it, and share it with somebody else. Thanks. August 5th here at New Hope is gonna be a really special day. That is Actus Sunday. Our very own missionaries over in Uganda are gonna be here to celebrate with us, to tell us about some of the cool things that God has been doing over in Uganda. You don't wanna miss that date. So put that on your calendar, August 5th. They'll be here all day, our Sunday morning service, our Sunday night service, and even a little something in between. So make sure you put that on your calendar. August 5th, Actus Sunday. Hey guys, I'm back. You thought you were rid of me for a few days, but I'm back. Hey, this is a very special message to our seniors. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, in the month of June, we had Carnival 55. That was a very special event for the seniors of our church. We had a record number of seniors show up for lunch that day. We had the carnival, we had the food, we had the sweet stuff to eat. We had a dunk tank where I got all wet. Many of you have said I was all wet long before you dunked me that day, but it was a fun day. 200 of us, more than 200 of you showed up and we are so grateful. We're gonna do that again down the road. But what we have coming up this month in the month of July, we've got to move the regular lunch one week farther down the road. Instead of the second Tuesday of the month, we've got to move it to the third Tuesday of the month. We have Vacation Bible School going on the previous week. So put this on your calendar, July 17th, Senior Luncheon. And it's gonna be a special one. Since this is the uh, 4th of July month, we're going to be honoring our soldiers. Uh, and you all are gonna engage in some letter writing uh, after lunch while you might watch a movie. And oh, I forgot the name of the movie. Let's see here, Andy Griffith is in it. Don Knotts is in it. It has, oh, I know, No Time for Sergeants. Some of you, we're alive when this movie first came out. So come, enjoy the movie, honor our soldiers, and enjoy a wonderful lunch together with our seniors. Have a great day, guys. August 26th is gonna be another special day here at New Hope Church. It is Baptism Sunday. So if you're interested in getting baptized or you know someone who is interested in getting baptized, August 26th will be the day. Feel free to email office at newhopechurch.net or just put on the comment card, baptism, and we would love to get you the information for that. Another way to get involved here at New Hope is to serve. We have so many different ministries that happen throughout the week, and we would love for you to come and be a part of them. Meet some new people, um, get to know New Hope on a whole nother level. One way that I would love to see some people serving is this ministry right here. We are producing announcement videos every week. So if you're interested in being, possibly being on a team for announcement videos, email chris at newhopechurch.net. I would love to sit down with you and connect with you. If you're techie at all and would love to help with that, I'd love to connect with you. Thank you so much for being here today. We're so glad that you're here. I'm so excited for what God is gonna do in your life. Oh, I'm 
I'm back again. You guys are going to wish I really would get out of town. Uh, for the seniors luncheon, that's in a week later in July than it's supposed to be, you don't have to bring any food again. This is going to be just show up. Food and desserts going to be provided for you. And we're going to send a sign-up sheet around starting next Sunday so we know how many to plan for. I'm looking for between 100 and 200 for you to show up in the month of July for our senior lunch, you guys. Okay? Hey, I'm out of here. Give them Jesus, Mark. It's like he never left, isn't it? Okay, I'd like to call our ushers forward uh, as we pray, and then we'll get into this morning's worship. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are your humble servants. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us to serve in so many different ways. Lord, we're grateful for this day as we are grateful for every day that you give us, every fresh opportunity as the sun comes up. And you give us this opportunity to start new because... You gave us your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for that. Lord, help us to have open eyes this morning, to see how sufficient Jesus is in our life, how there is nothing that we can want that he cannot provide or nothing that we can need. Lord, we lift up to you today those that we've offered in prayer. We pray for Pastor Tim and that group as they travel. We pray for safe travels and safe return. Lord, we pray for the upcoming activities this summer for Vacation Bible School, for the preparation of that. So many children are going to have the opportunity to hear the gospel. And we just pray that they will have open hearts, open minds, and have fun all at the same time. We thank you for all the resources you give us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to take a break from heaven for a little while. <laughs> Sounds like an odd thing to say, but Tim is the only one really that can do the justice that heaven deserves, so we're going to stray from the path a little bit today. We're going to talk about something else. But first of all, I just want to play a short piece of music in a minute. <laughs> uh, go ahead, and we'll... You'll probably know what it is straight away. Taking your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a okay. lot. All right, so that's the theme tune from Cheers, right. I just want to look at the words, the lyrics to this song. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to know, you want to go where everyone knows your name and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everyone knows your name. You want to go where people know that people are all the same. So cheers, it was a great show, different generation, although it just keeps on going and going. The theme tune is very well known. But that song sums up in a lot of ways what we want out of our lives. We want to be comfortable. We want to be somewhere where we know everybody, and everybody knows us. It makes us feel comfortable. We want people to know our name. And I'm sorry, I know I don't know all of your names. <laughs> we are working on that. But you also want people to be glad that you came when you go somewhere. We want people to know that our troubles are all the same, where people know that people are all the same. This powerful stuff that's written into these lyrics. But turn this around a bit. Don't you want to come to a church where people are glad that you came? Don't you want to come to a church where you feel comfortable, where people get to know each other, where most people know your name? Probably not all. But also you want to know that when you come to a church, everybody is the same. The same in the sense that we're all the creation of our Lord God. We're children of God, and we're sinners. We're all the same, and we, we need the same thing, the salvation of Jesus Christ. 
But cheers is one of those pictures of hospitality that make us feel comfortable. And I believe it's that feeling of comfort and relatability that made it such a wildly successful show. It earned 28 primetime Emmys and 117 nominations, which is a record. Even though in the first season it almost got canceled, it was that, it was that rough a start. So what we're looking at today is biblical and Christian hospitality. And we really want to look at three areas in that. It's a huge subject, but we're going to touch on three areas. The first one is the church, and I mean the physical church. I know there's two parts of the church. There's people that is the church, but I'm talking about the campus and the building that is the church. The second part that we're going to look at is our neighbors, our neighborhoods, where we spend a lot of time. Also, we're going to look at our community. For the most part, we spend the vast majority of our times within our communities. We choose to be in these communities. But we're going to start right here with the physical church, the building that is the church. There's a story of a pastor who made it a habit of being hospitable to his church members by visiting some of them on Saturday mornings. He went to one house, and it was obvious there was someone in there because the lights were on, the car was in the driveway, and he knocked on the door. There was no answer, so he knocked several more times. Still no answer. So finally, he took a card out of his pocket, and he wrote on the back of his card, Revelation 3.20, and he stuck it in, in the doorway. Revelation 3.20 reads, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. Well, the next day, which was Sunday, the same card appeared in the offering, and when the usher saw it, he gave it to the pastor. The pastor looked at the back of the card, and there was his verse, Revelation 3.20, and written underneath it was Genesis 3.10, which reads, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just hope that everybody here today felt comfortable, felt welcomed as they came in and dressed, as, as they came into the service this morning. I want people to feel like when they come in here that this is a group of people who understand the expectation of hospitality in the church body. And we all know too well that there are too many churches that don't fulfill that expectation. When Ronald Reagan was governor of California, and he and Nancy, when they had time, would go to the Bel Air Presbyterian Church. And when they were there, they would always sit a few rows back on the aisle. That was their set seats inside the church. Well, there's one particular occasion. They were running a bit behind time, and they arrived late. And the usher looked down, and he could see that there was a couple of college students sitting in those seats. So the usher said, Hold on. So he went down the aisle, he spoke to the college kids, and he said to them, you know, there's some seats in the far back corner. If you could move around there so that Mr. and Mrs. Reagan, or Governor and Mrs. Reagan, could have the seats, we'd appreciate it. So the college students got up, they moved to the corner of the sanctuary where there was some spare seats, and then the usher brought Ronald and Nancy Reagan down to their seats, and they sat down. Well, the pastor, to his credit, who was sitting on the stage, saw all this happening, and then during the next worship song, he went over to the students, and he said to them, as long as I'm pastor here, that will never happen again. Because the fact is, the church needs to be a place where it says, like in the song, people know that people are the same. Whether you're a CEO, whether you're an actor, a politician, billionaire, it doesn't matter. We're all children of God. And we have the same struggles. We have the same temptations, the same default to sin. But we all have the same access to the salvation that's offered by Jesus Christ. Another of my favorite illustrations, and if you've been on Sunday night, I'm sorry, you've probably heard this. Another of my favorite illustrations of the physical hospitality in a church building is the story of Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, if you don't know, is a world-renowned Hindu, and he was a leader of India who basically ended the 200-year reign of Great Britain in India through peaceful defiance of their colonization. During his student days, Gandhi read the Gospels, and he genuinely considered converting to Christianity. He believed that the teachings of Jesus gave the solution to the caste system in India. The caste system is like the class system. It's the hierarchy of culture in India. So one day on Sunday, he decided to visit a church in India to talk to a minister about becoming a Christian. However, when he got to the church, the usher said to him, I refuse to seat you. Why don't you go to the church with your own kind? 
That particular church in India was reserved exclusively for people of a high caste and white people. Gandhi left the church and he never returned. In his autobiography, he wrote, if Christians had a caste system, I might as well remain Hindu. It was due to this experience that Gandhi later declared, I'd be a Christian if it wasn't for the Christians. This is a terrible tragedy. Imagine what would have happened if Gandhi had embraced the Gospels of Christ and become a Christian. Imagine the spiritual picture of India now with the huge amount of influence that he had there. India is a country that is now 94% Hindu or Sikh and 2.3% Christian. And that's of the population of 1.3 billion people. It's the second most populous country in the world, vast majority Hindu or Sikh. But what would that have looked like if Gandhi had embraced the gospel and accepted Jesus? Would India now be a majority Christian country? I guess we'll never know. That ushers inhospitable behavior, even if he was just doing his job, not only betrayed Jesus in his teachings, but turned a person away from trusting him as a savior and potentially put in jeopardy the future salvation of millions. So yes, here in this context, Sunday morning context in a building, this, there is a particular expectation of hospitality, as there should be. When you think of the word hospitality, there's probably a few different things that come to mind. We all have different experiences, so we think of different things. If you're a world traveler, you might think of a five-star hotel, walking in through the revolving door and seeing a marble floor foyer with thick carpeting, a beautiful table with flowers on it, and over by the front desk, a concierge dressed in a fine suit, just standing there in anticipation, waiting for your, what you want, and even anticipating needs that you don't even know you have yet, because that's their job. Their sole job is to provide great hospitality to their guests. Or you may conjure up in your mind an image of a pristine house with beautiful furniture and everything in its right place, a wonderful dining table nicely decorated with a meal waiting, the sort of magazine page perfection of a home. Often this magazine home image, though, creates a lot of feel of inadequacy because we don't see our efforts measuring up to the glossy pages of perfect hospitality. But really, we don't need to, we don't need to worry. Practicing Christian hospitality isn't about the glamorous table. It's not about the platters of picture-perfect food. It's about practicing servanthood. More importantly, it's about loving others through Christ and making people feel noticed, making people feel special. But not everyone feels comfortable at the helm of a social event. Some people just seem to have a natural talent for making guests feel special, for making guests feel welcome. They can throw together lavish parties or they could throw together intimate gatherings with relative ease. You might think that these hospitality genes are inherited, but that's not true. Hospitality takes on whole new dimensions, whole new definitions when you look at it through the lens of Christianity. Some Christians have a hospitality as a spiritual gift. The Bible tells us that we all have at least one spiritual gift that we can use to further the kingdom of God. In other words, spiritual gifts are given us not for our own benefit, for the benefit of those around us, for enriching other people's lives. So we should be serving those around us, including the body believers, family, friends. And Romans 12, 13, however, encourages us all to practice hospitality, whether or not it's a spiritual gift. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality, Paul wrote. In fact, the Greek word phylozenia is actually a combination of two words. Phylos meaning affection and xenia meaning stranger. So while it's normally translated into the word hospitality, what it literally means is affection towards strangers specifically. 1 Peter 4 says, above all, maintain an intense love for each other. Since love covers a multitude of sins, be hospitable to one another without complaining based on the gift each one has received. Use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. So Peter writes, intense love. He's not kidding around. I mean, intense love. The book of First John makes it plain that when we love others, we are showing our love for God. Chapter 4, it writes... We love because he loved us first. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister who they have seen 
cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So if you love God whom you have not seen, you must love your brother and sister who are standing in front of you. He loves us completely and unconditionally. Equally, when we love and serve others in the community through hospitality, we are also serving God. Whether or not we have a spiritual gift of hospitality, it can become a way of life. I don't think anyone can deny that it's much easier to provide hospitality to those that we know, those that we love, those that we were comfortable with, familiar with. It's much easier than it is to share hospitality with a stranger on the street. But the New Testament teaches us that Christianity is a faith and a belief and is one of open hands, open hearts, and open doors. When we open our hearts as well as our homes, we are practicing Christian hospitality. And while it comes easy for some and more difficult for others, it's not easy to give of yourself, let alone to give of your resources and hard-earned money. But like most things in life, hospitality isn't perfect when we do it the first time. That's why Paul says practice hospitality. Practice makes perfect. So it can truly become a more comfortable part of our nature, easier in our lives if we just keep doing it. It's about the perspective. And here's one of the biggest challenges we have. We seem to always focus on the things that we don't have when practicing hospitality, when really we should be focusing on the blessings of God that we do have. It's a more positive outlook. Somewhere along the way, we'll realize that people don't come to our house because of the unlimited entertainment budget, or no entertainment budget. Rather, they come because they sense a loving kindness and a genuine concern. And that's the moment when your home becomes a sanctuary for those people that God sends your way. And God does send people your way. Quite often we don't notice it. There's people right in front of us that God has put there, but we don't notice it because we're too busy doing other things. But God does put people in our pathway, and usually for a very good reason. Just think if all Christians would practice hospitality in their own little sphere of influence, little area around us, of people that we can have influence over. If everybody did that, they would all overlap, and then there would not just be a single circle, but there would be a blanket of hospitality over a city, a state, a country. Because the bottom line is that God can use people like you and me to touch lives. It doesn't matter if we rent or own a home. It doesn't matter if we rent or an apartment. Our homes are an extension of ourselves. When we practice hospitality, it's an opportunity to touch lives in a very intimate and personal way. So we should be bold. God has not only given us a roof over our head, but he will give us the wisdom and the love that it takes to reach out to others in hospitality. It just takes sometimes a little bit of planning. And as always, it takes a lot of prayer. We should be prepared to to share our homes with friends, neighbors, and even strangers that God chooses to put in our path. So with this in mind, just who is it? Who are these people that we're supposed to be hospitable to? Where do we find them? Well, Lynn Corey wrote a book called The Incarnational Church. And you're probably thinking, what incarnation does that mean? (laughs) Well, the incarnational, incarnational is one of those words that no one uses in daily life. Think of it this way. Jesus is the incarnation of God. God in the flesh. To put it in very simple terms, God with skin on. So with that in mind, think about the church incarnate, church in the flesh. We name the buildings the church. We come to church on Sunday. But the reality of the early church was that it was the people, the followers of Christ. This was the church. In other words, the church was the flesh consisting of people, not buildings. This building is a gathering place. It's a place to come and learn, to study, to fellowship, and to become equipped to go out and live the life that Christ asked us to as the church in the flesh, the incarnational church. So Lynn Corey's book is about how we, as the church, should go into our own neighborhoods, how we, as a church, should go into our workplaces, and how we, as a church, should go into the schools where our children are, our grandchildren are, and we should model Christ. We should speak to people. We should give. We should serve. We should listen. We provide for all those people around us with the hospitality that Peter was talking about in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very wise words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. 
This whole concept comes back to one foundational and fundamental scripture that we find in Mark chapter 12. It's Jesus' own words. When he is asked what is the greatest commandment of all time, he replies, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be hospitable in every way. But is your neighbor the Christian that lives two doors down? Well, he is your neighbor. But most people in neighborhoods are surrounded by eight people, eight houses around them. Do you know the names of all the people in the eight houses around you? Or just occasional one here and there? Let me paint a picture for you. Imagine a place tucked away in Michigan's lower peninsula. Somewhere along the winding roads that hug the shores of the Great Lake, there's an idyllic town named Bayview. For more than a century, generation of Bayviewers have congregated there to share in their summer activities. What started out as a modest camping ground about 140 years ago for the Methodist Church has quietly developed into a beautiful vacation spot for people who can afford the upkeep of a second home. The streets are named moss and fern and maple and are dotted with impeccably maintained century-old gingerbread cottages. It paints a great picture of an ideal little village. But here's the catch. This paradise is not open to all. In Bayview, only practicing Christians are allowed to buy houses or even inherit them. Prospective homeowners are required to produce evidence of their faith as, out, as outlined in a bylaw produced in 1947, but then it was updated in 1986, so it's not ancient law. But they have to provide a letter from a Christian minister testifying that they have active participation in a church. One of the homeowners, Jeremy Schaefer, has had the house in his family for, for a long, long time. But he cannot legally put the house in his will with his wife as a beneficiary because she's Jewish. Whatever we perceive to be the legality of this particular situation, and trust me, there's been a lot of discussion in courts about the legality of this situation, but as Christians, we should find this toxic to us. There is no exclusionary clause to the love your neighbor's command. It didn't say love your neighbors as long as they're Christ followers too. We need to love in an indiscriminate way. We need to love to a point where it looks reckless, because sometimes God's love looks reckless, because God offers love to all at any time, and without discrimination. Mother Teresa once said, the problem with our world is that we draw a circle of family too small. Hospitality in this sense is different than what we normally think about when we look at glossy magazines or go into a five-star hotel. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus redefines hospitality to his host. When Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, you, should, you do not invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you and repay you. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So Jesus is saying something pretty strong here. It almost sounds like he's saying, don't invite your friends and family to dinner anymore. Forget them. That's not really what he's saying. If you literally read it, Jesus is saying to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't just keep inviting the same people over and over again, the people you feel comfortable with. Go outside your comfort zone. Find people that need love, that need attention. Jesus is always, always open to someone new. The nature of hospitality sees huge significance in our homes because our homes are the most notable expression of being a family, of being included. The meals that we have around a table express this in a very essential way. I want to take a quick look at the story of Abraham and Sarah and their generosity to three strangers that came to them in Genesis 18. The semi-nomadic lifestyle that they had in the country would often bring people from different cities and different places. And the nature of Canaan was that there was kind of a natural land bridge between Asia and Africa, which made it a popular trade route. There was no formal industry of hospitality. In other words, there was no hotels. People living in the cities and encampments around had a social obligation to welcome strangers. And these were very formal arrangements in hospitality. Scholars have looked at the Old Testament and they've looked at the Near Eastern texts and they've come up with what they think is seven codes of conduct 
for those days, which counted for good hospitality, and it also maintained the honor of those people involved. It maintained the honor of the communities that they were in. And the idea was that they readily accepted and offered protection to strangers that came to them. So around the settlement that they had was kind of a zone. In military terms, you call it the green zone. This is an area that once someone comes into that zone, then you are required and responsible to give hospitality to strangers. I don't know how big that zone is, but think about our own zones. So that was the first, the first sort of code of conduct was that once people come into that zone, it's your responsibility to take care of them. The stranger, the second one is a stranger must be transformed from being a threat to being an ally. So your greatest enemy could come into this zone of hospitality and they were instantly converted from being an enemy to a friend. Didn't matter who they were. Only the male head of household or the male citizen of a town or village may offer an invitation of hospitality. That's the third one. I think these days it tends to be the women that offer hospitality because they're frankly a lot better at it. The invitation has a time span. There's a certain period of time that you have to offer hospitality and it's kind of set. You can extend it, but both parties have to agree and then you can continue from there. The stranger also has a right of refusal. So he could say, I don't want any hospitality, thank you very much for asking. But the problem is, at that point, the host is gonna take offense and if they're an enemy, then all bets are off. If they're in the zone, it doesn't matter anymore. You've offered hospitality, they turn it down, so now all bets are off. But once it's accepted, the roles of the host and the guest are very clearly set. The host, the guest must not ask for anything, but the host must offer everything that they have that is the best that they have. The guest is then expected to reciprocate immediately with news, predictions of good fortune, expressions of gratitude, and, you know, say how honorable and decent these people are. The host cannot ask personal questions, but the guest can offer up personal information. And the last one is then the guest remains under the protection of the host until the guest has left this zone of hospitality. So they're pretty formal rules, and they were from a long time ago, but that doesn't mean that they're not necessarily still in place. There was a British explorer, Wilfred Thessinger, who wrote the book Arabian Sands, and he was traveling across an empty quarter of Arabian Peninsula in the late 1940s with a group of Bedouin. At one point, they were being pursued by a band of enemy tribesmen, and when the food ran out, ran out Thessinger and his escorts waited until nightfall, and then they rode into the enemy camp, into their zone of hospitality. The enemy was bound by honor and reputation to provide food, shelter, and protection for three days, which they did. So there can be powerful motivations for hospitality in some parts of the world. But what this does is it provides a backdrop for the New Testament command. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing. Hebrews 13.2. But we can look at a more modern version of this hospitality story, the Abraham and Sarah story. Gander in Canada was popular, has a population of 9,600 people. And this is right in the middle of Newfoundland, which is Canada's easternmost province along the Atlantic Ocean. It has a community center, an aviation museum, four city parks, and a Gander Mall. It's a pretty average town for most of its history. That is until September the 11th, 2001. On that day, 52 transatlantic flights were redirected to the Gander International Airport, and many passengers spent the night on their planes. The next morning, a convoy of buses took the passengers to the terminal where they were told to relax and they'd be notified when their flights were gonna be redirected. Well, that call came two days later. But what I wanna look at is the two days between when they got to the terminal and when they actually flew back out again. Because this community and the surrounding areas showed incredible hospitality to these strangers that had turned up most unexpectedly in their zone of hospitality. All of the high schools in the area, the meeting halls, lodges, churches, became places to house people some had cots, some had mats, they had sleeping bags and pillows, all provided by the local community. The elderly passengers had no choice. They were to stay in private homes as guests of the residents of Gander. One pregnant woman was housed in a private home across from the 24-hour urgent care, and families were all kept together. All of the high school students were required to volunteer, at least somewhere, and make a, make a difference in someone's life. They provided phone calls, emails, as people needed them, without any restriction. During the day, the passengers were given excursions, maybe on a boat or in the forest, the local forest. 
The bakeries made fresh bread for their guests every day, and food was prepared by residents and donated, as well as the restaurants donated food. They were also given tokens to laundromats. One flight attendant put it this way. Passengers were crying and telling their stories. It was absolutely incredible. When the passengers came on board after their stay in Gander, it was like they'd been on a cruise. The overwhelming hospitality was remembered by the passengers of one of the planes who raised $40,000 in funds scholarships for the high school students in Gander. This is important because some people in a faraway place were kind to some strangers who happened to literally drop in on them. And they're a good definition of hospitality. And I guarantee that the residents of Gander got as much out of it as the people that they served. So what can we do? What are there opportunities for us to serve in this capacity? What are some areas we can open our hands, our hearts, and even our homes for this, to this kind of hospitality? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, a mother who has a two-year-old child that's in an abusive relationship. Finally, she had had enough. She packs up her child, she packs herself up, and she leaves, going into an unknown future. She doesn't want to have anyone in her life. She had some friends, but they're also friends with her husband, and they won't see him in the light that she sees him. She's fearful about her child's welfare. She goes to a shelter where a bed for her is found. She needs to find work. And the shelter, although a blessing for her, is not the kind of place that she wants to put her child in. She fears for the safety and security of her two-year-old. How can she go and find work and get into a better situation herself if she doesn't have somewhere for her child to go during the day? And at night, she worries about her child's safety. This is truly a dilemma for many. She wants to stand on her own two feet. And she wants to be able to provide for her daughter, but she has little or no support. She's afraid that, afraid that over time, her lifestyle will garner too much attention from Child Protective Services, and they will step in and put her daughter in a foster care system, a system that can be a gamble. There's plenty of fantastic foster care parents out there, but there are some that do it for the money, and they do more hurt than help. It's a tough situation, one that as a church, yes, the universal church, but more specifically now New Hope Church should care about. Later this month, we'll be launching a partnership between New Hope and the ministry Safe Families for Children. This is a ministry that deals with situations like this and many more. What they do is they take a church body in a city and they provide safe and nurturing environments for children. You could call it kind of a voluntary foster care system. But what happens in the Safe Families for Children is that they provide care and respite for parents who are in great need before things get to the point where the children are taken by Child Protective Services. The parents maintain contact with the child or the single parent. They maintain contact with people in the church. And there are people in the church who can have other roles, like they can help the parents that need the help. We'll be looking for families who can take on this responsibility, host families, but also, there's other roles, too. We need people who can do short-term babysitting, who can help with the host family, who can help with the parents that need help, but also just provide resources if necessary when they need it. This is the idea of a church coming together as a family, loving as a community those who often find themselves in these situations, often through no fault of their own. This type of ministry is an opportunity to live out the commands of Jesus, to put into action the type of love that God wants from us, and the spirit of the type of community that we see in the second chapter of Acts, where it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke breads in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. You'll hear much more about this ministry over the next four weeks, and we'll do a proper launch on July 29th. But I want you to think about it, pray about it. I believe that Safe Families for Children is a very tangible way that we can show true biblical hospitality, whether hosting a child, babysitting occasionally, or becoming a family coach, a family friend, or just providing resources when necessary. It's a community coming along those that are in need. James spoke about caring for the widows and the orphans. In modern terms, this is the marginalized, those in need, those that are unable to defend themselves. It's our neighbors. It may not be in our neighborhood, but they're our neighbors. The Bible is clear about the role of hosts, and we must provide for those around us, friends, family, strangers, even enemies. We must provide love like God's love. We must provide a listening ear, a hug, some resources, whatever is needed. Others will watch and wonder, 
Why do they do so much in service of others? We can provide a place of security for others because we have a place of security in Christ. We can provide comfort because we find comfort through our Lord Jesus. And in turn, they will see what it is to be hosted by a heavenly Father. People are all the same. Children of God, in need of salvation, but he gives us this salvation through his Son. I'm going to finish with Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, because it kind of sums up this fairly well. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that we are open to hospitality that you require of us. That we will have open hearts, open hands, open doors when you put people in front of us that are in great need. We pray for safe families for children, this ministry that has done so much good work already. We pray that they will find the host homes that they need, that the people that will be served by them will be blessed in every way and they will see why they've been blessed. And you will open their eyes to your love. We thank you for all the resources that we have that we can provide to others. We just ask for your wisdom in this. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, have a great rest of the day and a great 4th of July. Thank you all for coming.